You're listening to The Real Well Show with Kathy Fetke, the real estate investor's resource. Will we see home prices continue to decline? Will we see an uptick in foreclosures? Is it best to just keep a bunch of dry powder and not buy anything until we see a massive recession or even depression? I'm Kathy Fetke and welcome to The Real Well Show. Our guest today has been here before. He's one of my favorite people to interview and just also one of my favorite people. Rick Sharga is going to answer some really tough questions here today on The Real Well Show and I think give people a lot of advice as to what they should be doing and where they should be putting their money today. Rick Sharga is the founder and CEO of CJ Patrick Company, a market intelligence and advisory firm for companies in the real estate and mortgage industries. He's one of the country's most frequently quoted sources on real estate, mortgage, and foreclosure trends, seen on CNBC, CBS News, NBC News, CNN, ABC News, Fox, Bloomberg, and NPR. I actually got to do an interview with him on Bloomberg a few years ago. That was a lot of fun. Rick has over 20 years of experience in the real estate and mortgage industries, including roles as the Executive Vice President of Market Intelligence at Adam Data Solutions. EVP for Carrington Mortgage Holdings, EVP of Marketing at RealtyTrack, and Chief Marketing Officer at 10X and Auction.com. And it's truly an honor to have him here on The Real Wealth Show. So Rick, welcome back. It's just wonderful to have you here. Thank you, Kathy. Always nice to be here. It is great to have you here, especially during these confusing times. Hopefully you can make some sense of it. Uh, We just had existing home sales. It sounds like the Median price went down, but sales inched up. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, we're kind of right in line with where I expected to be at this point. I, I my for, my forecast for the year was that we'd see between four point three and four point four million existing homes sold, uh, and that home prices would be down for the year nationally, but marginally somewhere less than five percent. And the the main number is I think we came in at four point two eight million existing home sales uh, annualized. Uh, and and home prices were down about three percent year over year, so no real big surprises there. Uh, important for investors to know that they can almost disregard the national numbers. Really need to be paying attention to what's going on in your local market because while nationally the median price of a home was down three percent, it's down more like double digits if you're on in, if you're in, in markets like coastal California, Seattle, uh, Las Vegas, Phoenix. Austin, Boise. Uh, on the other hand, if you're anywhere else in Texas or if you're in Florida or the Carolinas or Tennessee, we're still seeing prices go up a little bit. So it, it really, really varies pretty wildly market to market. And it, if we're in a correction, and we probably are, it's going to be a very localized type of correction. I'm so glad you said that because we don't have our weather channel giving the average weather of the nation every single right. week or every month, freaking people out about climate change. You know, it's it's the certain markets. You wouldn't plan a trip to Florida and want the average, you know, U.S. temperature. Yeah. It does you no good. I don't even know why we use these national numbers anymore. It, it does it give any value. I think it does. Just from from a, an historical standpoint, the, the reality is that within the margins, the housing markets across the country tend to move in the same direction. Uh, not all at the same pace, but you know their prices tend to go up or they tend to go down. Um, and and it's when you get into a more volatile, uh, more confusing market like we're in today, where you do start to see some more pronounced regional variances. And uh, during the boom, uh, which which we saw from really when the COVID lockdown expired through the beginning of, of 2022, you also saw market outliers. So you saw, you know, things that were clearly aberrations like Boise having prices go up 47 percent a year. You know, no disrespect to Boise, but there was no particular reason organically why that would have happened. Um and you know those markets are now some of the ones that we're seeing the the prices claw back. So it it's uh, you're right. I mean, if I if I'm investing in uh, Shreveport, Louisiana, uh, the national number is largely irrelevant, and so it, it's also irrelevant what's going on in New York or Seattle. Uh, I need to know my local market, uh, and that's that's critically important. The other 
thing that that I don't know. I think you and I have talked about this before. Is is people you know who want to do something other than just look at prices always ask what they should be looking at, and I, I typically say I, I look for two underlying trends in a market. One is population growth, and the other is job growth. And if you're in a market where you're seeing population increasing and, and the number of jobs increasing, odds are you're going to be in a pretty good housing market, whether it's for owner-occupied properties or rental properties, uh, because population and jobs are, are you know what tend to drive those markets. So look for those kind of things in your local market too. And and again, you know it doesn't matter if the national unemployment rate's three point six percent. What is it in your market, and 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 is it going up or down? So you know really really important to be doing that local homework. Yeah, job growth, population growth, you're singing my mantra. <laughs> That's uh, what to follow. But I always add one more, which is affordability, because yeah. would you say that Austin, I mean, I don't know this right now, but does Austin have job growth or loss right now? I think the numbers are still going up in Austin, although I wouldn't swear to it. Um, but you're right about affordability. Uh, if you look at Austin compared to the rest of Texas, it's like two different worlds, uh, relatively speaking, when you come to affordability. Um, the other thing that's been a bit of a, a bottleneck in Austin is uh, the city hasn't invested in infrastructure to keep up population growth. Mm. Um, and that slows down home construction. So, you know, the, the, again, you have that supply and demand imbalance, which uh, which becomes a bit of a problem. But but yeah, affordability is key. And so you, you also want to look at wage growth. Uh, we, we look at the headlines always talk about home prices. They talk about mortgage rates. Clearly, those are two really big drivers when it comes to affordability. But the third leg of that stool that most people never pay attention to is wage growth. So what are wages doing in your local market? Um, and they've they've been pretty strong nationally uh, and, and in most markets. But, um, you know, I'm still optimistic for 2023, the second half of the year, Kathy. Um, I, I, I think we've seen home prices in most markets either plateau, decline slightly, or are, are still appreciating, but at a much, much more rational level. Uh, I do believe mortgage rates will start to come down uh, in the second half of the year, and wages have continued to be pretty pretty healthy. So, you know, you combine those three things, and affordability starts to feel at least a little bit better. Woo! Okay, lots to unpack there. So <laughs> let's go. Oh, I love having you on the show. Uh, okay, so <clears throat> let's go to, for example, Dallas. We have a single family rental fund in North. <clears throat> excuse me, in North Dallas, very very north up north of Prosper and okay. uh, where a lot of the chip manufacturing is coming. And it seems opposite to Austin, the Dallas Metroplex and certainly in the suburbs seems to be planning for all the growth yep. uh, in the area where we're investing. It's just miles and miles and miles and miles and miles of freeway expansions, cranes everywhere. And yet we're, we're still buying properties in the hundred thousand dollar range. It, it's crazy. Uh, you know, what, Sometimes you hear that Dallas is being hit hard, and I wonder, are they just talking about Dallas, the metro, or, uh, or Dallas, the city, or the metro area? But anyway, what are your thoughts on Dallas compared to Austin? Well, Dallas continues to expand, and it's doing it based on an influx of jobs. Um, and uh, I, I just read an article that uh, talked about the, the influx of Californians into Texas. And apparently the last full year they have data for was 2021. And there were 111,000 Californians that, that migrated to Texas. Um, so you have a lot of people coming from more expensive regions into less expensive areas. They tend to not care if they're overpaying for properties, given whatever the local market conditions are. Uh, and eventually that does tend to result in prices correcting um, over over some period of time. But but I, I think the way you described it is, is exactly right. You have uh, you know good jobs coming into into the Dallas Metroplex, uh, chip chip manufacturers coming in. Um, and the 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 city and state governments are trying to get the area ready to accommodate those kind of manufacturing facilities, which means they're going to build build out the infrastructure. Um, I think the reason you're still buying properties affordably is because until those plants are there and until those jobs are are starting and until the people have moved in there, it's all speculative buying. Uh, and and a lot of and and you know you can get some really great buys, but the the flip side of that is if anything goes wrong, 
uh, you wind up holding properties that you probably overpaid for. So I think, you know, uh, you being the, the shrewd businesswoman that you are and, and having a lot of experience in knowing what to buy and when to buy it, um, you know, you're hedging your bets. But uh, I, I think Dallas, you know, even if even if certain parts of Dallas are experiencing a little bit of downturn, the uh, the region itself is still poised for for pretty significant growth. Yeah, I mean, we're we're these are renting out as fast as we can get them renovated. So so far so good. And, and, and think about that. Think about that too. We're talking about a lot of jobs being created that are being filled by people coming in from out of state, not just Californians, but but elsewhere. And typically, if you move into a new market, if you really don't know what you're doing, you rent before you buy. So I, I think the opportunity for rental properties, particularly from people who are moving from a house into a new area, uh, they probably prefer to rent a house than an apartment. Um, and I do think at least in the in the short term, that provides a, a good opportunity for rental property investors. Yeah, it's been it's been shocking. Everything is coming better than than we predicted in terms of our acquisition costs. Our renovation costs are coming in lower, shockingly, and rents coming in higher than projected. So we we do feel confident. But again, the the whole nation is every single city has its own economy, right? Yeah. Yeah. And people forget that uh, they're they're all operating on their own timeline. So there were a few other things you said in that packed sentence prior to this. And that was that you think mortgage rates are coming down this fall. I think so too. And I get a lot of comments of people saying, well, that's because you know, you're in the real estate market and it's wishful thinking. Uh, why do you say that? So I, I well, history uh, basically uh, is, is a good predictor of the future. If you, if you know where to look um, historically, every time the federal reserve has stopped raising rates, we've seen mortgage rates come down. Uh, and that's that's true as far back as Freddie Mac has has tracked mortgage rates. Uh, it, it's not always instantaneous, uh, but it always happens. Uh, and and it's not because the Fed funds rate comes down, but it's because of of what goes on in the economy after that after that happens. Uh, the Fed is is likely to stop raising rates this year. Uh, I know Chairman Powell said there might be one or two more raises left in the Fed funds rate as they continue to fight inflation. But inflation, the, 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 the CPI index is now down to 4%. Uh, so it's trending toward that 2%, two, 2.5% two goal that the Fed has already stated. Um, and absent any unpleasant surprises to the upside, I wouldn't be surprised to see another quarter point increase in the Fed funds rate in July. But I'm hopeful that might be the last one. Uh, I do not believe the Fed will reverse course and start cutting rates this year. But uh, let's assume for sake of being optimistic that July is the last increase and they announce that after the fact, uh, you will start to see interest rates come down. There's, a, there's a, another predictor that, that suggests interest rates on mortgages could be a full point lower uh, under more normal conditions. Um, I don't know, most people probably don't realize, but the 30-year mortgage rate is based loosely on the, the yield uh, of a, U a 10 year US Treasury bond. And, and usually the, the difference between the yield on that bond and the mortgage rate is about a point and a half or two points. Um, right now it's over three points. So if it, in a normal market, if we're looking at a 3.7% yield on a 10 year bond, <clears throat> the mortgage rate would be at the most 5.7%. Today it's at about 6.8, 6.9. Uh, and that's because of the volatility and risk in the market, because nobody really knows what the Fed's Fed's planning to do. Uh, so I think once the Fed announces they're done for the time being, we'll we'll see the market adjust accordingly. Uh, and I would not be at all surprised if gradually over the course of the second half of the year, we don't wind up back in the fives uh, for the fourth quarter. Just fascinating. OK, so what and why is that that the spread is higher? The market, the market is pricing in risk and volatility. They just don't know what the Fed might do next, uh, how high they might raise the Fed funds rate, what the implications are for the rest of the market. Um, so they, they have that built in. Uh, and, and so once the Fed basically announces they're going to go back to a more normal cadence, uh, the, the, I think the risk gets priced out of the market uh, similarly, but it won't come out all at once. The, the rates will not go down as quickly as they went up. Um, but I think you'll see a slow and, and steady decrease in those rates 
uh, really for the entire second half of the year, unless, as I said, we get any unpleasant surprises to the upside in terms of inflation, in which case uh, the Fed may not stop raising rates anytime soon and maybe we get stuck. I've heard theories that the reason the spread is so big is because mortgage companies are maybe greedy or they know they can right now, or no. they're trying to make up for losses. And I, that's what I said. No, I no, say, no, 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 that's not it. That's not how it works. <laughs> no, it, it, that'd be nice. And, and everybody has a tendency to blame the banks and blame businesses when, yeah. whenever they don't like something. Um, <laughs> fact, fact of the matter is most mortgage companies are losing money on most loans they write right now. Um, they, they haven't scaled their operations back far enough uh, to, to, make the kind of profits that they, they would normally make. The, the mortgage companies that are profitable are very likely to be ones that also handle mortgage servicing today. They're actually making more money on managing the loans than they are on writing the loans. Um, the, the, uh, the higher mortgage rates are actually really hurting the mortgage industry. The, the, uh, the volume of mortgages written last year dropped by about 50% compared to the year before. Uh, anybody who thinks the mortgage industry is raising prices so they can cut their volume in half is is just doesn't understand how business works. Uh, and mortgage volume is going down again this year. So both refinance and purchase activity is down because those higher mortgage rates make it harder for people to afford a home. If they can't afford one, they don't buy one. They don't buy one. They don't take out a loan. Um, and the other the other factor here is with six point nine percent mortgage rates, the seventy percent of of homeowners with a mortgage who have a, an interest rate of 4% or less, aren't really inclined to put their home in the market. So there's not much inventory to buy, which is what's keeping prices up. So so no, uh, much as it would be fun to blame the mortgage companies for this, they're, they're not raising prices to gouge borrowers. And I agree with that. I was a mortgage broker for years. Well, mortgage, yeah, broker for years. And, uh, you know, you're not trying to lose business. You're comp- That's the beauty of competition. You're always yeah. trying to get the give the best rate to your client so you can get the deal. So I, I didn't agree with that either, but hopefully um, we would see rates come down. And what do you think will happen this fall if, if that is the case with, with home sales? So we had a really weird year last year in that January turned out to be the high point for existing home sales. Uh, and every month after January consecutively, we saw fewer and fewer existing home sales. I, I've never seen that happen before. It, it may have happened, but I've never seen it. Um, there's a seasonality usually to home sales where you see sales peak in May, June, July um, and and fall off in the fall a little bit. I think we might see a reversal of that. And, and we did see it after the COVID lockdown was lifted, uh, where people were allowed to come out and play again. And, and so uh, went on a buying spree. So I, I think if rates come down, you'll see more properties come to market uh, and you'll see more of those properties. You'll see those properties sell relatively quickly if they're priced correctly. So we could see a little bit of a, uh, an unexpected mini boom, if you will, in the, in the second half of this year, uh, if, if interest rates do come down enough to entice people to put their homes on the market again. So it would kind of unlock this lock-in effect where Mm -hmm. there is so little inventory um, for for many reasons, but if rates came down, then those move-up buyers might consider doing that, put their house on the market and and move somewhere else. Um, And and so do you think it would increase inventory if rates went down? Yeah, but I mean, we're we're going to have to see them come down probably more than a point um, before you you see a meaningful increase in inventory. A lot of the economists I follow think you're maybe looking at the, the inflection point, maybe being somewhere even as low as 5.5% before you, people get over that psychological barrier. Mm-hmm. Um, but but yeah, I, I do think as rates come down, you'll see that rate lock effect lessen and you'll see more inventory coming to market. And there's certainly pent up demand for uh, for, for home home buying if if we do see more properties coming to market. So I don't. I think you know that I am uh, also a co-host on Bigger Pockets on the Market podcast. It's one of their newer ones. Been around about a year and a half, and you were on it. <laughs> I think I, I wish I had yeah. been the one interviewing you. I'm going to have to have a conversation with them about that. <laughs> but we just interviewed somebody on the show who predicted that um, the housing market is going to just go into a full on crash. And she said, Oh my gosh, tell all your friends to sell everything. And I just was like, what are you talking? Like, where are you getting this data? And, um, she said, well, I've been driving by, um, various 
streets and seeing for sale signs. And I thought, well, we, we there represent... You, there you have it. Conclusive <laughs> proof, data-driven analysis. And this is someone who's regularly on Fox News talking about these things. So is there a chance of a housing crash? There's always a chance of a housing crash. Um, you know, nothing in life is guaranteed. There's also a chance that a meteor will strike and we go the way of the dinosaurs. Um, I think they're both about equally likely. Um, no, they, they're... I, the 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 dynamics that were in place that caused the last housing crash back in 2008 are not in place this time and everybody points to one metric which is well home prices really escalated last time and that and therefore we had a crash and so they went up again this time and so you know logically we'll have another crash and that that's just not the case um the last time we went through the 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 boom cycle it was unqualified borrowers getting loans they never should have got, which drove prices of homes to astronomical levels. Um, there was a glut of supply. We had 13 months supply of homes available for sale, which is twice the normal uh, amount that we'd want to see in a healthy market. In this cycle, we've seen prices go up partly because of supply and demand. There are just more people looking to buy than there were, looking, there, there were, were homes available to purchase. Uh, historically low interest rates, which made those homes affordable. Um, and and now we're looking at less than a three-month supply of homes available for sale, which is half of what we we normally want to see. So, I mean, if, if, if we had a massive recession and unemployment went up to 10% and people started defaulting on their loans and, and losing their homes to foreclosure, we could, we could see a crash. But, but right now, just the simple supply and demand imbalance we have is keeping prices from cratering. So we've had uh, what some people have referred to as a housing recession because the volume of home sales has dropped pretty significantly. But even at that, we're going to wind up with 4.3 million homes sold this year and, and 600, 650,000 new homes sold this year, which you know, in the overall scheme of things isn't that tragic. Um, and, and prices, I, I just I don't see a very likely scenario where prices crash. Um, could that happen in a local market somewhere? Maybe. Could it happen nationally? Anything's possible, but I somebody'd have to convince me of of you know what how they came up with that math uh, that suggested something like that was going to happen. And I I just don't see any scenario likely scenario where that's the case. Yeah, and Elon Musk, of course, tweeted the same thing. And I thought, boy, you know, stick to rocket ships and digging holes. I mean, you know, I don't know that he's the expert in, in real estate, but it makes you think, does he know something about the credit market that we don't know? Are the banks all going to fail? There won't be any loans. I mean... No, worst, worst scenario I've seen came from an economist at CBRE. And they analyzed all, I think there's 4,800 banks in the country, something like that. And, and they took a look at their commercial real estate portfolios and said about 300 of them are vulnerable uh, because of how much and, and the kind of commercial notes that they have in the commercial markets in a bit of a mess right now. Um, that would be a fraction of what we saw back during the Great Recession. Uh, and, and these would typically be smallish banks that would be, be the most vulnerable. And the other banks are sitting on enough capital they could absorb them pretty quickly. Um, the banks have tightened credit since we saw the you know the failure of Silicon Valley Bank and First Republic and, and Signature Bank. So credit's a little tighter. But but by the way, that's another reason you, you wouldn't necessarily expect the housing market to crash because the only people getting loans are highly qualified borrowers who are highly unlikely to default and put those properties back into market at a distressed price. So even even tightening credit uh, and you know Elon. Elon paid forty-four billion for Twitter, and and probably you know should be more focused on what he's spending on things he's buying than what people are paying for their homes. <laughs> you know, he might he just might have over overpaid for that one. <laughs> oh, that's when you got to keep your emotions out of things, right? Yeah. Okay, so let's talk about that commercial world because it seems like commercial real estate is facing the same challenges that residential faced in 2008 with all the adjustable rates. Today, residential's mostly fixed, right? Almost all, yep. Almost all. So residential's just kind of solid. It's it's fixed rate loans. We're not experiencing the pain of the Fed raising rates because it's like, oh, well, my fixed rate's the same payment I've been making. Yep. But that's not the case in commercial. 
So where do you see that industry headed? And when I say that commercial includes so many different things, so I'm sure different asset classes will be affected differently. What do you see? A lot lot of these commercial mortgages are bundled into securities, uh, commercial mortgage-backed securities, and about one and a half trillion dollars worth of those are coming due in the next three or four years. A lot of them are in multifamily, which doesn't worry me that much because uh, we talked about this. There's a lot of demand uh, for renters as well as as owner occupants, and so I, I think the multifamily market will, will be okay. Um, a lot of it's in office, and an office is problematic, particularly in a lot of big cities right now, where you have vacancy rates approaching forty percent in some markets, and and that has a trickle down effect to other commercial properties, retail and and service centers and 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 the like. Um, you know, if the, if the office building is half empty. That means there's only half as many diners to go eat at the restaurant nearby, and there's only half as many people dropping off dry cleaning and so forth and so on. Um, And so I I think, you know, people that hold those kind of loans on those offices and some of those those retail centers are probably going to be the most vulnerable over the next couple of years. And we're, we're seeing more commercial foreclosures than than usual. Now, the numbers are tiny compared to overall foreclosure activity, but they're running 40, 50% 40, 50% higher than they normally do. So I, I do think we're going to see a little bit more fallout in the commercial space. I don't think it's going to be a, a, an enormous meltdown overall because typically the the, the, the owners and the, the note holders and the, the, the finance folks figure out some sort of workout uh, rather than you know the, the nuclear option. But we will definitely see more foreclosures in that market than, than we typically see. And I think... I think commercial exposure is worse this time than residential. I'm seeing multifamily syndicators in distress. So are you thinking it's just a handful of of multifamily syndicators, maybe new at the business who didn't know to get rate locks and and or fixed rates that are going to be affected? Or I mean, just well, just anecdotally, I'm seeing a lot of stress. Yeah, it's it, and that I think that's key word, Kathy. Is is anecdotally, um, you're you see we've seen a couple high profile syndicators get hit, and mm-hmm. typically they were over leveraged somehow, or they uh, they they kind of miscalculated where the market was going, and and you can't necessarily double your financing costs and offset that by doubling rent uh, because that that just doesn't work. Um, so we'll we'll see some fallout, but but again, overall, I think there's enough demand. We've seen rental prices stabilize; they're still going up in most markets, just not quite as rapidly. Uh, and I think that market will work its way out uh, out of trouble. But but yeah, there there will definitely be some failures in that in that category. You know, keep in mind a lot of the a lot of the owners of both single family and multifamily are actually smaller investors, and in many cases they will have long-term fixed rate financing. Um, that, that's that been a very popular financing model, particularly for single family rental owners over the last few years. Um, so we'll, we'll, we'll see where it all, it all shakes out. But um, I, I, of, of the commercial segments, the two that I'm least worried about are industrial and, and multifamily right now. Uh, market conditions could change, but that's, that's what I'm seeing today. Fascinating. Okay. We're starting to see headlines of a soft landing. And that's been new, right? A lot of people thought we were going to hit the recession this year and it was going to be deep and dark and just hasn't happened. We've had job growth. We've still got 10, over 10 million job openings. So, you know, is the Fed going to keep raising rates? Like you said, you don't think so to usher in this recession. What do you, in your crystal ball, I know you get asked this all the time, but are you worried about a big, massive depression coming? No, no, I, 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 I think history again suggests that we're likely to see a recession. Uh, the last of the last eleven times the Federal Reserve has raised the Fed funds rate to combat inflation, going back to World War II, uh, they've done it eleven times, and eight of those times they've overcorrected and steered us into a recession. The other three times were when they acted proactively uh, rather than waiting until inflation got too high. And in this case, I've already admitted that they waited too long and, and mm-hmm. inflation was more intransigent than, than they, they thought. Um, the uh, the other historical data point is uh, the, the yield curve inversion. So when the yield on the, on the two-year treasury bond is higher than the yield on the 10-year, which means your short-term investment is worth more than your long-term investment, um, 
the last seven times we've seen one of those, we've had a recession follow, and we've had a pretty significant one this time around, uh, still a case. So I look at those two items and it suggests that a recession, if not inevitable, is very likely. But the rest of the economy is so strong right now that I think if we do have a recession, it'll be fairly mild and fairly short. Uh, and, and I don't think we see a huge wave of unemployment or, or certainly anything resembling a depression. Well, I hate to say this selfishly, but every time people, these headlines warn of a housing crash and warn of a recession, it's just better for buyers. Yeah. It's just better for people like me with a single family rental fund. We have hardly any competition right now. No, I, I, I think people are a little concerned uh, and, and it's worth watching. But um, again, I think likely we'll see a recession probably late this year, maybe early next year, but I don't think it'll be particularly deep or particularly massive. And not everywhere, right? There's going to be pockets of America that just boom. Continue. Well, it's 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 kind of where we started the conversation, but the uh, the national numbers will vary locally. So, you know, if we have a national recession, which means two consecutive quarters of negative GDP growth, it doesn't mean the growth in your market is going to be negative. You could be in a market that's growing even during a recession and your unemployment problems may not be as high as the national numbers, or they may be worse. So just as we talked about housing, you know, when it comes to the overall economy, really, really important to understand what's going on in your local market uh, and that you might be in a market where it pays to be a contrarian. Rick Sharga, thank you so much for joining me here on The Real Wealth Show. It's always just such a pleasure. I always enjoy the conversations, Kathy. Look forward to seeing you soon. And thank you for joining me here on The Real Wealth Show. If you'd like to find out more about what's happening in those growth markets of Texas and Florida and the Carolinas and Alabama and actually Indianapolis has been really growing, just go to realwealthshow.com when you're there. It's free to join. You can have access to our investment counselors who invest in all of these markets. They are the real deal and they'll help you with your plan. And if you're ready, they'll refer you to teams nationwide that we've worked with for over a decade that our 70,000 members rave about. If these teams do not get rave reviews, they are not on our referral list. So again, you can check that out at Real Wealth Show. Com. And also, if you want to find out more about our single family rental fund in Texas, a totally passive investment for you. Let us do all the work. We get the loans. We do the acquisitions, the renovations, everything. All you have to do is invest. You do have to be an accredited investor and all the details on what that means and uh, webinars and presentations on our fund are at Grow Developments. Dot com. Again, that's grow, like grow your portfolio and developments, growdevelopments.com. And thanks again for joining me here on The Real Wealth Show. The views and opinions expressed in this podcast are provided for informational purposes only and should not be construed as an offer to buy or sell any securities or to make or consider any investment or course of action. For more information, go to realwealthshow.com.